Hello, welcome to Finding Respect in the Chaos on thinktechhawaii.com. I'm so happy to be back with you all. It was a little bit of a uh, hiccup there where I was out for the last couple of months, but I'm really happy to have you all back with us here. We've got all kinds of stuff going on right now in this world too. A um, lot of chaos, right? Especially in Washington, all this stuff with Judge Kavanaugh. You know, we're looking at so many different things and we've got important stuff happening here on this island too and in these islands and i'm here today with justin murakami justin thank you for coming welcome all right thank you so much for having me it's really nice to have you here um justin writes policy for um the sex abuse treatment center and he was here one other time and we talked about the bills that were going to be going through the um, legislature and so now I've got him back here and we're going to talk a little bit more about what happened with those bills. Um, of course it was a few months ago but I've been out for a couple of months so I'm happy to be back though. Um, you know this stuff with Judge Kavanaugh I think really um, sheds a spotlight on the gender inequality stuff that we've got going on because mm -hmm. especially with him Specifically, Judge Kavanaugh just recently was adjudicating a case for a girl who had come in. She was a minor, 17. Mm -hmm. She um, was an immigrant. And so she wanted to get an abortion. There was bad circumstances involved mm -hmm. in the way she got pregnant. And Judge Kavanaugh kept delaying it and delaying it and delaying it. And he is on record as saying that 17-year-olds well, this girl anyway, who was 17, um, was responsible for her behavior. Mm -hmm. And now, here we are, you know, fast forward to what's happening now with um, Dr. Ford coming forward with these allegations of um, attempted rape. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to her. And now what we're hearing from all the Republicans is, oh, they were just 17. Well... 17-year-olds are held accountable for what they do. They're tried as adults. Mm -hmm. um, if a 17-year-old rapes somebody, they go to jail. They don't just go to juvenile hall. Right. They go to jail. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really big thing that it seems to me anyway, like the Republicans are just kind of trying to push it under the carpet. Oh, it just happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And that to me is just wrong and unfair and really shines a light on how messed up our system is yes. in this sort of stuff. And I think that, you know, it um, is a story about inequality, um, gender inequality, economic inequality, racial inequality, right. insofar as there are special rules for certain people, whereas everybody right. else is held to a certain standard where, you know, age 17, you're almost an adult, you're responsible for your behavior. Right. Right. So um, we see a lot in how there are classes that are treated differently and given the benefit of the doubt and e how it even works within those classes. So right. keeping in mind that both, you know, um, uh, Ms., uh, sorry, Professor Ford, um, Dr. Ford really, right. right? And Judge Kavanaugh were part of the same elite private school community right. and how we're seeing the idea that a 17 year old boy, man, is not responsible for their actions, whereas, the, whereas a woman would be held accountable for, you know, everything that happens. And there's right. a lot of victim blaming going on. Oh my there, gosh, right? there's so mm -hmm. much victim blaming going on. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Why didn't she come out before now? What took her so long? Mm -hmm. You know, and that is a standard normal thing mm -hmm. for um, people that have been sexually assaulted, right. that they don't come out ahead of time because public shaming, mm -hmm. and look what's happening to her, kind of proves that to be right. Absolutely, so how on the one hand can you say a person has an obligation to come forward immediately, you know, which completely misunderstands the entire concept of what trauma does to a person exactly. when a person has been sexually assaulted or sexually abused. So. On the one hand, it completely misunderstands that dynamic. Right. But at the same time, 
um, you know, it answers its own question. Why don't these people come, for, why don't victims come forward earlier? Because of the victim blaming dynamic, because people right. automatically don't believe them and say, in a, and say as much. And in um, the case of Dr. Ford, you know, it goes beyond that. She's been forced to leave her house because she's received death threats. Right. Now, you know, she is engaged in an active courage to come forward. Yes. You know, um, say what she will. You know, there is credibility behind her allegations. Um, there were letters from her community. I think there was one letter with a thousand signatures, another with um, dozens of her classmates from her school saying that this is the environment that they grew up in, that there were these sort of, you know, so whether it happened to her, um, it is a believable story because it has hap it happens. Right. Right. And um, in 2012, uh, she also reported to her a therapist. Right, in right. 2012. Absolutely. So years before this appointment mm -hmm. was even, you know, out mm -hmm. or thought of. Right. So that makes a big giant difference. And then when you consider the way the Republicans are trying to just rush this guy through the whole appointment process anyway, mm -hmm. um, and then now continuing on that whole track of rushing him through so fast, when he has come out in the past about being against um, pro-choice, he's very pro-life, but he doesn't want to talk about being pro-life when he's being interviewed by the senators. And I watched some of his um, uh, the interviews that they did with the, the senators interviewing him. And you could just tell he was so evasive with every answer almost when it came to direct questions that the Democrats put before him about women's issues specifically. Mm -hmm. And and so that just really made a difference for me when I thought, wow, you know, you hear all this stuff, oh, he's gonna, you know, get rid of Roe versus Wade and all these other things. And you think, well, it's just noise. And then when I sat down and actually listened to the guy, I'm like, whoa, he's dangerous. <laughs> he's a dangerous guy. But so we just have to, Mm -hmm. well, Talk to our senators, right? Get our voices out there. Really make our voices heard about how we feel about what's just happened. You know, I think it, yeah, and, and I'm not here to comment on, right. you know, the politics when surrounding what's happening. I don't mean to put you on the spot, sorry. No, and I'm, and I'm not. I'm just, you know, the point being that um, there are certain social inequities and dynamics that are playing out here and that um, there is a there continues to be a intractable misunderstanding of how trauma impacts victims um, right. and uh, and a misunderstanding of how victims can ra sh can and do rationally react to um, abuse and assault sexual violence right mm -hmm. yeah to hide and to shame yourself even and and all of that so that you don't end up coming out sooner mm -hmm. right yes well, all right, let's talk about some local stuff that's happening here with some of the bills that we talked about before. Um, of course, I don't remember all the numbers, um, but I know you do. So I, I would love it if you would give us some of the results of some of the things. Um, give us a little bit of a recap of the bill itself, mm -hmm. and, then, and then let us know what happened with it. I think it's important for, for all of us to know. Sure. So... Um as we had talked about in the previous, <laughs> in our previous meeting, right. um, SATC, the Sex Abuse Treatment Center, um, was really pressing for three main legislative agenda items. Uh, the first was Senate Bill 2719 from this past legislative session, um, having to do with the civil statute of limitations. Um, we were seeking both the reopening of a window period so that old cases could be brought in court. Uh, as well as an extension of the underlying statute of limitations. And we were going to increase that from age 26 to age 40 uh, for child sex abuse cases. Oh, gosh, and that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, as knowing my own experience, I didn't remember until I was in my, I was 30 years old when I had my first memories. Sure. And so I think that bill was so important. Mm -hmm. I know I was calling my senator saying, Ah, come on. So what ended up happening? Yes, um, and, and, and to acknowledge what you were saying, um, you know, studies have found that really um, adult survivors of sexual violence in childhood often don't come 
um, forward with their right. um, with their stories or dis are able to disclose their abuse until well into their 30s, 40s, right. and Even 50s. if they do remember. Mm -hmm. like for me, I didn't remember until right. I was 30. But for people that, even people that do remember, because mm -hmm. there's so much other social trauma and social mores that get put mm -hmm. on it that you don't want to say anything. There are a lot of pressures not to disclose, right. exactly. Absolutely. So um, what happened with that bill was we were successful in getting a um, two-year extension to the window period. So, you know, in effect, um, there is no civil statute of limitations for the duration of those two years because old cases can be brought and, you know, newer cases are still within the existing statute of limitations. Oh, okay. But we um, do need to change that underlying statute of limitations um, in order to address, you know, there is this concern for uh, these older cases, right? right? People who had been victimized decades before. But what about um, more recent and future victims? The world has not changed. And I think we see this, right. you know, in um, the Kavanaugh case. The world has not right. changed so much that the dynamics are there that is easy for childhood victims to come forward and disclose their right. abuse. I mean, ourselves. Me Too is helping, but it's not changing it completely. So when you say two years, wait, I'm trying to understand this. Does this mean that you've got, even the old cases now have two years to bring their old case forward? Is that what it is? Um, is that yes. what you're saying? Yes. Yeah. Oh, so okay. there was a previous window period. It, had, it was a four year window period. Um, it actually expired in 2016. Oh. So we have now reopened it for an additional two years. So, okay. so those cases can be brought in. Um, you know, the cases that were brought into that included the Kamehameha Schools case against the right. um, psychologists out at St. Francis Hospital. Right, and you hear mm -hmm. on the, I hear on the radio, I hear on television, all these lawyers now mm -hmm. that are running ads for, you know, they're talking about the fact that this bill has changed mm -hmm. and that we are able to bring forward old cases. And right. they're trying to drum up support so to speak I don't know get the word out I like that that is at least because they're mm -hmm. taking out commercials so that means that's getting the word out to right. people a little bit more mm -hmm. and so. the hope is that people do come forward and are able to seek justice for themselves and hold their founders accountable oh, yes. um, and it's you know you talk about changing the culture we, we again you know the Me Too movement has brought a lot of this to light things right. like bringing cases will bring it to light, and that's how um, you know we change the understanding right. of these dynamics as we make it um, as as we make um, understanding more normal. Right, mm -hmm. exactly, and mm -hmm. I love that those things are are changing. You know, when you say how important it is for uh, victims to be able to come and hold their abusers accountable, mm -hmm. I was able to do that um, in the delayed discovery. Um, I don't know what you would call that umbrella. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, wait, this is way back in the 80s. Right. This is long before anyone did this stuff. Mm -hmm. But it made all the difference in the world for me mm -hmm. to have him stand accountable, to have him have to you know, be in court and say that he did it. Mm -hmm. He did admit to his guilt. So yes. I was really lucky. It was an easy fight. But, but what a difference it made for me for him to have to pay a fine and to stand in the courtroom, right? Yes. Well, listen, right now, all this is great. And we have so much more to talk about. We have to take a break right now. And I hope that everyone will come back or stay with us, please. Um, finding Respect in the Chaos, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, here with Justin Murakami. And I know you're going to be interested in what we talk about next. So stay with us. Hey, this is Andrew, the security guy. I'm here in the Think Tech Hawaii studios, and we do Security Matters every Wednesday at 1 p.m. We're talking access control, we're talking intrusion, we're talking video, we're talking voice. All the things that are important to security, things that you should know, things that you should think about when you're out there in the community, uh, things that you should look for um, to keep yourself safe, because security matters. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then.
Welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and we are talking about some really important bills that have just gone through our legislature uh, about a month and a half ago, two months ago, I guess it was over, huh? Uh, at the end, it, at the beginning of May. Oh, gosh. No, it's okay. It's <laughs> so like a little bit of a summer break. <laughs> Not at all. So I was sick. I got behind the curve here. Mm -hmm. But we're doing it now, and I think it's important for people to get the message out there that um, okay, so give us the next one. What's the next one that we want, we're so going to talk about Just here? before the break, you had mentioned, you know, the, de the, the delayed disclosure um, right, right. that you had. It's important to note just that Hawaii also has a provision in our civil statute of limitations that we would also be seeking to extend. Um, you know, that was part of the reform to extend the delayed disclosure um, statute of limitations window. Um, because it's not all, even after discovering injury, it still, you know, you don't know where that person is in their life and right. they need to be given the opportunity to deal with whatever they may be dealing with at the point of life, but still be able to bring their case for it. Right, a little bit later. Yes. For me, I just jumped right on it. As soon as I found out I could do it, I'm like, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I know that most of the people that I talked to at that time were like, oh, how are you doing that? Why? I could never do that. Mm -hmm. And I realized with most of the, even in the groups, because I was in a 12-step group for survivors sure. of incest, and oh. um, mm -hmm. all of the people in the group, you know, overwhelmingly said they would not be able to do it. Right. They would not be able to go forward mm -hmm. with it. People do need that time to heal first and get some strength mm -hmm. back to themselves and to get past some of that shame and everything to, to be able to move forward. Yeah. So that didn't get to go through on that bill then? Is that what you're no, saying? It's so just the two years, huh? Just the two years for now. So we will be coming back um, and asking for that underlying statute of limitations. We, we don't want to lose momentum on this because if the justification is there right. for the two-year window period, it's hard to see why the justification doesn't exist for right. the underlying statute of limitations. So is that what they said? They said it wasn't justified and they couldn't justify doing that? You know, there... It, um, there was never a clearly stated reason why they would opt for the option hmm. of the two-year window as opposed to the underlying statute limitations. Um, you know, it could just be a matter of this issue doesn't come up all the time. And it, it again, you know, uh, the, the way to do advocacy around these issues is to educate, educate, educate. And hey. um, obviously, you know, that message resonated with the legislators because they did pass the two-year window extension. So um, we can only hope to build on that going forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, educate, educate, educate. There's a bill that was about that, right? Pre prevention, education. There was. For the teachers and for in the schools, mm -hmm. right? That was a really important one. So Senate Bill 2368, which was um, our Aaron's Law legislation that progressed Aaron's this Law, year. that's what it was mm -hmm. called, right. Okay. So in previous years, we had been seeking a working group or a task force to sort of bring together the stakeholders and uh, figure out how to implement a project, uh, a program for the state of Hawaii in our uh, Department of Education and Public Schools. Right. Um, what this bill would have done, and it was introduced by um, a number of the Women's Legislative Caucus members, um, had a lot of good, strong support, would have, um, it was that it would have mandated the department to implement a program. Would have. Would have. So in other words, it didn't go. Mm -hmm. So the department. I don't understand how they could not vote for that. That's, um, prevention is nine-tenths of the cure. Mm -hmm. How could they not? Well, for that, that I don't understand. Well, um, I mean, the Department of Education, as we know, you know, is the one of the largest um, school districts, functional school districts in the country, and they've undergone significant leadership changes with the incoming of a new superintendent. Right. So the hope is that you know we're able to show them that they should be prioritizing um, the the health and well-being of students, and right. and the impacts of sexual violence on Hawaii school students are clear. Um, the Department of Health has engaged in a youth risk behavior survey of um, middle and high school students, which actually shows that um, children and youth in Hawaii experience rape at a higher um, rate than their national counterparts. Oh, wow. um, they experience more intimate partner sexual violence than their national counterparts. Um, and that, that effect is actually disproportionately um, shown in certain counties, Hawaii County, for instance, for, for example, has um, a higher rate than the rest of the state. So, wow. um, you know, we can make a really strong case. Uh, as I said before, and when we previously met, um, the experience of the sexual assault centers is that um, regularly on a year-to-year -year basis, maybe 50% or more of the survivors that we treat um, are abused or assaulted when they are younger than the age of 18. Wow. Yeah. 
So these are the these are these are the what the statistics and the surveys and the facts are showing hard numbers that um, youth in Hawaii really do need a program and where is one of the only places you can reach them and make a cultural change, right. but in the school system. Right. So I know we have like the respect program that's here locally, mm -hmm. um, and those are all programs for the schools to go out and teach kids what respectful behavior looks like. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there's the no more, and I think, the, well, that's in colleges anyway. I don't know if that's in mm -hmm. high schools and middle schools. Yeah. So um, um, the RESPECT program is actually um, a product of the um, Sex Abuse Treatment Center. Right. Um, it's a curricula-based um, prevention um, uh, program, and so it has components where we go out into the community and do community group education. Right. Uh, but the Department of Health is actually funding a project right now and has done so for um, several funding cycles. Uh, where uh, there's a train the trainer model with respect to Department of Education um, educators, where we teach them about the curricula right. um, and they take it and they apply it, some with more fidelity, some may use it to inform their practice. Um, and to date, I think that we've trained maybe 7,000 educators. Wow. Or, I'm sorry, maybe 700 educators. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 7,000. I, I, apo I, apo like I every apologize. Is that like every teacher in Hawaii? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> 700, still 700 is huge. That's right. a huge number mm -hmm. of teachers. So what, in, in your opinion, what would you say was the underlying reason why this didn't go through? That is it just that they are not, I mean, they still can, mm -hmm. but they're just not required. Is that the way that, am I understanding that right? Uh, yes, yeah, so, um, so the curricula exist. Um, there are other curricula as well. Um, so the department approves the curricula for you. So our curricula and are are, you, are are approved for use with the, as as a health curriculum. And so right. um, schools can select it. They can teach it to different degrees. Right. To well, Molokai has a big, huge respect mm -hmm. program that has like radically changed domestic violence and sexual violence and assault in that school, or actually, apparently, on the whole island, mm -hmm. of what the kids at that school are reporting anyway, that has completely radically changed things. Just instituting that program has changed um, things. Has radically changed Molokai, mm -hmm. yes, which I, is exciting. Right. And um, you know, part of the Department of Health um, project is that we are trying to um, demonstrate you know, those attitudinal changes, that sort of cultural mm -hmm. change that you know, will make a difference and right. hopefully create a generation of, of, of students who do not sexually abuse and who know how, who know what sexual abuse is and understand concepts like consent. Right, mm -hmm. right. I've, uh, I don't know if you've seen some of my other shows. I have, um, I had my brother on one of my shows who is um, a doctor who has a program over in Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's doing is he's teaching young boys um, the name of the program is Ujima'a, um, and it's Together We Can Heal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what he's doing. Is he's going into the schools and teaching these programs about respectful behavior, what it means to set um, healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. And sort of, you know, and so it has changed the rape culture in the areas mm -hmm. where they have done this. He's been doing it for about 20 years now. Yeah. So he's really able to get some good numbers and really get some good statistics. Mm -hmm. And he's been studied by uh, Johns Hopkins and Stanford, mm -hmm. and they all have put a stamp of approval on his program. Mm -hmm. And it's all about teach kids young. Mm -hmm. If we can teach them young, we can change the way they grow up. Right. And, and they can even help their parents in the process. You know, and, and that's the only way we're going to change this whole messed up inequality that's going on. Yep, but isn't that cause for um, optimism that you know, it generally demonstrates the global nature of this movement? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yep. That's just where I was going with that. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so we had one last bill that was on our um, agenda, which was um, Senate bill 2342 which was clinical victim support services we were seeking insurance coverage for these um, services um, by a psychologist or a therapist uh, for a sexual violence survivor um, where they would connect them to services they might work with their employers or their schools right. um, on things like safety planning or reasonable accommodations so that a person wouldn't lose their job or drop out of school as a result of 
you know, having been victimized by sexual violence and decompensating psychologically. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, did that pass? Um, unfortunately, no. So, um, oh, gosh. So we really need to get people out there engaged mm -hmm. and motivated to really talk to their senators, talk to their representatives, let, um, let them know. Mm -hmm what needs to happen and that we need to make these changes mm -hmm. right yes and so um, in that case you know there was um, a question about the appropriate procedure for passing a new um, a, a revised insurance mandate um, and so uh, we're going to be going in with a resolution as well as a bill um, and hoping to um, uh, to get that passed um, you know, this with it within the next couple of years, within the next bi um, legislative right. biennium. So when is the next uh, legislative session going to be? It'll start in January. It always starts on the third Wednesday of January. Third Wednesday of January. Okay, okay everybody, you heard it. Third Wednesday of January. We've just got a couple minutes left. Do you have one last thing you'd like to maybe share with everybody? No, just that um, we're going to have a very busy year. Um, you know, I, as always, um, the Sex Abuse Treatment Center uh, runs this policy um, public policy program to really institute system change and we invite members of the community to engage with us um, so I my number is posted on our website my um, okay. I can I'm available by email and if anybody wants to you know become engaged in this movement um, receive alerts about um, you know important right. bills that are moving then I'd be happy to okay. to outreach them or engage with them all right mm -hmm. yeah so remember that you guys out there the sex abuse treatment center is available if you are a victim and you need help go see them they are amazing and and even if you are not a victim if you want to get involved in the public policy that needs to change so that we can really make some significant changes to our culture then i ask that you please get hold of them let let them tell you exactly what you need to do and how you can approach your legislators to try and make the changes that need to happen in our society. Okay, so it was great to have you, Justin. Thank Always you wonderful. so much for coming back. Well, thank I, you. I hope you will come back again. I'm going to keep having you come back and keep <laughs> us posted on what's happening. And we'll have an exciting year, definitely. Yes, we <laughs> will. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here with us today. This is ThinkTechHawaii.com, and I am Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Finding Respect in the Chaos is back. I will see you again soon, so I hope you'll come and join me again.